Hello again, everyone. This final section of Unit 12, we will be looking at the rise of power, the emperor, and the fall of Napoleon Bonaparte. As usual, make sure you have your Lecture 3 worksheet out and available and are filling it out as we go through the lesson. If you missed something, please feel free to go back, check your work, and watch the video again if you need to. As always, please feel free to ask any questions if you have any as well. And with that, let's get started. So, who was this Napoleon guy, and why should we care? Napoleon Bonaparte was born in 1769 on the Mediterranean island of Corsica. By today's standards, he would be considered a short guy, standing only 5 feet 3 inches tall. Back then, however, the average, that was about the average height of most men. History considers him one of the greatest military leaders of all time. Now, who really cares how tall the guy is? Well, for one reason, history remembers him as being a short guy, and that fact being unique to people of his type of responsibilities. That being said, keep in mind that their system back then of measurements is different than ours now. Today, that would be the equivalent of him being about 5 foot 7 inches. However, for some reason, history considered him short uh, for some reason, even back then. We're not sure why, but by today's standards, he would be short. Back then, probably not so much. Here we see a piece of a, uh, art painted by Jacques Louis David titled Napoleon's Crossing the Alps. It is believed that the horse's name here is Marengio, named after the Battle of Marengio, for which Napoleon had ridden him. An interesting fact about this horse is that after Napoleon had conquered, uh, had conquered, or was conquered, sorry, the horse was taken to England and sold. At the age of 38, the horse died and was preserved. Today, the bones of the horse are on display at the National Army Museum in London. So, let's talk briefly about Napoleon and his successes and his coup d'etat. In October of 1795, rebels marched onto the National Convention and Napoleon was given the job of protecting the convention from these rebels. With the assistance of his gunners, Napoleon was able to force the rebels into a panic, causing them to flee. Because of this, Napoleon was hailed as a hero in France. Moving on, in 1796, Napoleon was appointed to lead the French army against Austria and the Kingdom of Sardinia. He was able to quickly sweep into Italy and won in a series of battles. A short time later, Napoleon tried to have the same success in Egypt, but failed and was defeated by Horatio Nelson of Great Britain. Napoleon was able to keep his defeat out of the newspapers, which allowed him to continue to be considered a hero of France. By 1799, the Directory, which was given to the name of those leading the government at the time, had lost the confidence of the people. After returning from Egypt, Napoleon was urged to seize political power. Napoleon would in short time become the first consul and assume power as a dictator. A coup d'etat is simply a French term that refers to a, a sudden seizure of power or blow of the state, where one person tries to take over the government and create a new government. That's a coup d'etat. Looking at his early career, um, let's look at his rise to power uh, and the Egyptian campaign. In 1798, with the hopes of defeating Great Britain, Napoleon was defeated by Admiral Horatio Nelson, who ended up destroying the French fleet at the Battle of the Nile. Napoleon ended up abandoning his troops in Egypt and returned home only to receive a hero's welcome. He was able to prevent French newspapers from publishing his losses from the African battle, which allowed him to keep his status as a very popular uh, military leader. Napoleon's Rules for France Upon returning from Egypt, the French government fell, and in 1800, uh, Palisabites, or the vote of the people, approved a new constitution which gave all the real power to Napoleon as the first consul. Once in charge, he kept, many of the challenge, change, sorry, he kept many of the changes from the French Revolution that had been fought over. Once in charge, he fixed the economy by creating a national banking system and created an efficient tax collecting uh, tax collection system. 
In an effort to make peace with the popular Catholic Church, Napoleon also signed what's known as the Concordant, or an agreement, with the Pope, which says that the government recognizes the influence of the Church, but rejects the control of the Church in national affairs. Basically saying, Church, you are religion, me, Emperor, I am in charge of national stuff. You do your stuff, I'll do my stuff. He also created what became known as the Napoleonic Code, which is a uniform set of laws that eliminated many injustices. Napoleon wanted to heal the divisions within the Catholic Church that had developed over the confiscation of the Church's property and the civil constitution of the clergy. But Napoleon's clear intent was to use the clergy to prop up his own regime, take advantage of the situation for his own purposes. Here we see the pamphlets of the Napoleonic Code uh, as it was. It was divided into three different areas personal status, property, and the acquisition of property. Its purpose was to reform the legal code to reflect the principles of the French Revolution. It created a set of law for all of France. This painting is known as the Allegory of the Civil Code. Here we see Napoleon writing his code with the help of the Angel of Death. You can see the scythe and the black wings on this angel. Do you think the artist thought these codes were a good idea or a bad idea? Napoleon became so popular that he was able to crown himself emperor in 1804. In a symbolic gesture, he took the crown from the Pope and placed the crown on his own head. This signified that the church was not above him. Unfortunately, Napoleon's goals for the New World would not occur, which would not occur, which would lead him to sell to the United States the Louisiana Territory in the New World uh, to President Thomas Jefferson in 1803 for 15 million dollars. He was able to battle and conquer the surrounding areas of France uh, when they allied together in an attempt to overthrow him. These countries obviously lost. They would lead to creating the largest empire in Europe since the Romans more than 1,500 years earlier. France was good at land battles, but at sea it was the English who ruled. Napoleon would virtually lose his navy in the Battle of Trafalgar to the British and Admiral Horatio uh, Nelson. This loss had two effects. First, it ensured supremacy of the British navy for the next 100 years. Second, it forced Napoleon to give up his plans to take over uh, and conquer Britain. By 1812, Napoleon had controlled Spain, the Grand Duchy of Warsaw, and the German kingdoms, as well as France as a whole. Here we see the land purchased by Thomas Jefferson in the Louisiana Purchase. Thomas Jefferson was able to pay $15 million for the massive expanse that would nearly double the size of the United States. Here we see Empress Josephine, Napoleon's wife. Their marriage was certainly one of twists and turns. Shortly after their wedding, Napoleon had to leave to war. However, Josephine would be involved with several different men. Eventually, Napoleon found out about her cheating on him and never loved her the same way again. It was about that time that Josephine began to love Napoleon and would remain faithful to him, though he never reciprocated. He later on would divorce Napoleon and remarry only for the sake of getting a male heir. He would get his wish, though it is believed that he never really did love his second wife. Being Empress Josephine must have been nice. Look at this bedroom. Here we see the wedding of Napoleon and Josephine. It was such a grand event, obviously. And Napoleon's cushy throne when he was emperor. And finally, here we see Napoleon's bed. Uh, I guess they have a thing for four upholster beds or something, but it doesn't look like there's a lot of room for anybody but him. Oh well. This painting was done in 1806 by French artist Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres. It is portraying Napoleon on his imperial throne. That looks pretty heavy. 
Those that gained power and popularity ultimately would fall in the end. And that is what happened to Napoleon. Let's take a look at three costly mistakes. First, Napoleon implemented what he knew as, or what he called, the Continental System. In an attempt to crush Britain, Napoleon used a blockade to prevent trade and communications between Great Britain and Europe. It was not a very tight blockade, and smugglers were able to get through. Great Britain responded with his own blockade. Because the Na British Navy was much better at sea than the French, their blockade was more effective. Because of Britain's blocking trade into France, American ships would eventually get involved and be taken by the British Navy. These, this would lead to the War of 1812 between Great Britain and the United States. Here you can kind of get an idea of how far France attempted to go in order to prevent trading with Europe. France tried to completely block, block off Britain from the rest of Europe. But again, because of his very untrained navy, he was not able to obviously monitor everything that he would have liked. And here's the divorce statement of 1807, which officially made the divorce uh, official from Napoleon and Josephine. Uh, here he has to say, far from ever finding cause for complaint, I can to the contrary only congratulate myself on the devotion and tenderness of my beloved wife. She has adorned 13 years of my life. The memory will always remain engraved on my heart. So he must have really loved her considering the fact that she was cheating on him for years. Eventually, obviously, it would end in a divorce. This painting shows Napoleon and his second wife, Marie Louise, who would provide Napoleon with an heir. The second mistake that Napoleon would make was from the Peninsular Wars. People in Spain were getting concerned over Napoleon. Spain was under the control of Napoleon. Uh, and they were getting concerned over his policy of the blockade. Guerrilla fighters resisted Napoleon and his attempt to enforce the continental system on Spain. In this war, Napoleon would lose over 300,000 men, which weakened the French Empire. Napoleon's third mistake, and probably his biggest, was the invasion of Russia. Because of the breakdown between Russian and French alliance, this caused Napoleon to invade. Napoleon took over 420,000 soldiers to invade and march onward towards Moscow, the Russian capital. Instead of taking the French directly and head on, the Russians retreated. While doing so, they used a scorched earth policy that called for the burning of all supplies, crops, and anything else that the French could use while the Russians were retreating. Eventually, Napoleon would get to Moscow only to find that the Tsar Alexander had destroyed Moscow before Napoleon could take the city. After months of hanging out in Moscow, Napoleon heads back to France. The problem was that this was during the harsh part of Russian winters. By the time the French troops would get out of Russia, there were only about 10,000 troops left. By 1810, Napoleon was in control of the majority of Europe, but that wasn't enough apparently, hence why he decided to try and take on Moscow. After marching through much of western Russia, Napoleon and his troops would get to Moscow and find it abandoned and burnt to the ground. The Tsar had basically set the whole city on fire. And here's another picture of that. By early 1813, Napoleon was on his way home from Moscow and ended, only up, ended up with about 10,000 troops. Um, According to this uh, document, 40,000 survived. We have, my other mention was 10,000. You can see there's some differences here. The guy is looking a little depressed. After losing over 300,000 troops uh, in Russia, that's about the size of Madison, by the way. Actually, it's more than the number of people in Madison. This guy killed 300,000 of his troops to gain territory. So he lost a lot of power just by losing the number of military personnel that he did. 
And now we get to the beginning of the end for Napoleon. With his army's defeat, by, the early, by early 1814, the leaders of Prussia and Russia were able to march triumphantly through the French capital city of Paris. They really had no opposition because what was left of Napoleon's military was, was not good. He really, they weren't really trained. They were able to easily defeat Napoleon's troops. In April of 1814, Napoleon accepted the surrender that required him to give up his throne. Additionally, he was banished to the tiny island of Elba. It was the brother of Louis XVI that took over power, but he was very unpopular. Here we see Elba, um, the small island off the Tuscan Tuscany coast of Italy in the northwest corner of Italy. Here we see the painting of Louis XVIII, who was the brother of Louis XVI, who took over France upon Napoleon's surrender. Wait, though. Napoleon isn't done yet. Not at all. Napoleon escapes Elba in March of 1815 and lands back on French soil. He is greeted with a joyous crowd and within days is restored as the Emperor of France once again. Not too keen on his return, the rest of Britain and Prussia attacks Napoleon in the Battle of Waterloo. Once again, Napoleon is defeated there in the attempt for his second bid of power. This period is known as the Hundred Days, the time period from his return to France up until the Battle of Waterloo. Once again, he is exiled to St. Uh, Helena this time, which is an island in the South Atlantic Ocean. Napoleon would spend the remainder of his life there. He died in 1821 of some sort of stomach ailment, possibly cancer. And here's his estate on St. Helena. Here we see a picture of Napoleon's tomb today. Originally, he was buried in the Geranium Valley until 1840. In October of that year, his remains were exhumed and brought to Paris. The King of France at the time demanded that the French Emperor's remains should not be kept on English soil, so he requested to the British that the remains be returned. They were brought back and were placed in St. Jerome's Church until 1861, when the construction of his final tomb was completed, which you see here. Here we see a picture on June 28th of 1940, after Adolf Hitler was visiting the tomb of Napoleon, shortly after defeating French forces a month earlier. Ironically, Hitler would make some of the same mistakes Napoleon did, including trying to invade Russia during the winter. Hitler's troops met a similar fate as Napoleon's did. Final result. Napoleon was a military genius, but millions of lives were lost in his wars. The British would become the dominant force in Europe, and European countries were now freed to establish a new world order after the fall of the French Empire. It had once been ruled by Napoleon, but now these areas were free to be ruling themselves. And there you have it, Napoleon Bonaparte, and how his rule set the, er, his rule and the end of the French Revolution that would uh, forever change Europe. After his downfall, new countries, new borders were drawn out, and new governments were created. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture and have successfully completed the lecture worksheet. If you have any questions, please feel free to check out the video again or ask me for any assistance. So have a great day, stay safe, and stay awesome.